What's up, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Blood on the Razor Wire TV, where we bring it to you real and we bring it to you raw. Hit that subscribe button, hit the like button, make sure you leave a comment, and I promise to respond, and make sure you share the video. Got a special guest on today. I got one of the homies on from Boston, um, Bobby D, um, Bobby from Boston. He was a young man, 22 years old, sentenced to, I believe, 188 months. He copped out, thought he was getting 60. They careered him. And he ended up with 188 months at the age of 22. Went to some dangerous places. He spent some time with Jimmy Coonan from the Irish Mob, the Westies, Nikki Scarfo. But you know what? Let's just get into it, man. Bobby, what's up? How you feeling today, brother? <clears throat> what's going on, man? So I know at the age of 22, you walked into USP Lewisburg. I know eventually you made it to Beaumont, at some other places or whatever. But what was it like for a 22-year-old to walk into USP Lewisburg, man? Was it like a... Castle, what was it like, man? Yeah, man, the place, uh, driving up to the place was definitely in, uh, intimidating uh, scene, you know what I mean? Uh, place looked like a medieval castle, never seen nothing like it, didn't know what to expect. Uh, I was brought right into the processing. They, uh, they process you there, they strip you out, put you on the chairs, you know, all that normal shit that they usually do it's a crazy life to walk in there i talk about that in my book how when we were pulling into big sandy and it was like a just like just like a castle man the door the the thing slides and then you hear it bang and then you're sitting in there on the bus you're waiting to get in there there's a bunch of dudes on there everybody's nervous we're going to big sandy dangerous place just like lewisburg was back then right yeah yeah so you get to lewisburg what's it like for you man i mean you're 22 years old, facing 15 years. Are you thinking about the streets? Man, I didn't really know what to expect. Um, never seen nothing like it. Never, you know what I'm saying? The politics. Uh, people see me. I was probably the youngest dude they seen come in there in the last 20 years. Uh, the turnover rates in there, dude, they don't, people don't come and go like FCIs and all that. People there, once you're there, you're there. You know, so most of those people that have been there, they've been there with each other 15, 20 years already. And I know you were over there probably with my um, my old celly, Adam Oliveri, who stabbed the cop. Were you over there with Adam? Yeah, he was on my block. We were both on B block. Uh, he was actually one of the first dudes that schooled me, uh, helped me out, tried to put me in the right direction. Um, you know, I got a good celly, Danny Byfield. You know, the homies uh, basically uh, just put me onto the program and told me what was going on. I mean, back then, the Boston car was pretty deep, pretty violent if they had to be. Um, usually Boston and New York run together, right? Yeah, yeah. What was Adam like, man? Was he, was he a joker back then? When I was at Sally, he was always joking, always playing, but could become violent at the drop of a dime. Yeah, that's that's the thing that always, uh, definitely about Adam, man. I've I. He was always smiling, always joking, always trying to help somebody. Um, but yeah, in the drop of a dime, bro, that he turned into an animal. And that he did, man. He stabbed the cop at Big Sandy. Um, he ended up getting convicted. He copped out right on the day of trial. And I think he got another 23 years or 25 years. And pretty much, man, that put his lights out, man. Now he's got till the sun burns out. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit about Nicky Scarfo, man. I'm going to use your picture with him for the thumbnail. But uh, was that one of the last pictures he ever took? Yeah, he told me, uh, he's like, yeah, pal, this is going to be one of the last pictures I take, kid. You know, and uh, we're really close. I work with him in the kitchen. Um, I helped him out a lot. The dude was older. He never changed, bro. He's always the same. Fucking, you know, a lot of people didn't like him, but the dude never changed. He was the same every day. Why didn't they like him? Just curious. Uh, you know, different reasons as far as, you know, like the wise guys and shit like that in the system. But, uh, you know, I got along with him fine, dude, you know. And uh, he ended up getting real sick right before I left. And uh, he sent my mother a Christmas card. And that was the last I heard of him. Heard he passed away, so. Damn, man, how'd it feel leaving and knowing that you were leaving him behind after you guys had become close? Man, it, 
I learned a lot from that dude, man. He's he totally he, he you know we talked about his case and you know his son and stuff like that and and uh, he, dude taught me a lot, man. I was with his son too in Coleman, man. I was with his son for a while. He was all right, dude. I liked him. Some people didn't like him. They thought he was arrogant. He acted like he was tough. He was just a little fella, but I got along with him. So you're working in the kitchen with Nikki. What's it? What is he? The butcher? What's he doing in there? Oh man, he's rolling silverware. Rolling silverware, dude. Crazy it's man. Just, it's not that he had to work. He wanted to be in there doing something. He was all the dude was up at five thirty, bro, out there walking, doing his little exercise and stretching. I mean, he was on a routine, dude. He was that's what he did. How about Jimmy Coonan, man? He had been there. Holy shit, he probably been there a long time, right? How was he? Was he depressed? Did he, did he I mean, how'd he look? How'd he act? Man, Jimmy, every every time I seen Jimmy, he was smiling, bro. Face always all red, you know, s- smoking on a stogie. Because back then we could still smoke over there in Lewisburg. And, um, you know, we'd see him, he'd grab you on the track and, you know, he had to put his arm around you, like, and, and, and talk to you real close. You know what I mean? It was funny, man. And you go up in the TV room, he'd be popping popcorn like this, just dying, laughing. You know what I mean? Like he, he was getting out tomorrow. That's crazy when you see dudes like that that've been in there so long, and you're like, "Damn, man, you, you wouldn't even know." Like I used to tell people that all the time. Like if I didn't tell you how much time I had, you would have never known. You know, I had a 40 year sentence. But man, I, I, you have to smile to keep from crying. Sometimes they say. You ever heard that saying? Yeah, yeah. He just. I feel like he just accepted his circumstances. You know what I mean? He was just. You know, he was bitten. He's under the old law. I think he he's eligible for parole at some point, right? I'm not sure. Um, I know he's. I know he's. Uh, I think he's in a medium now. I'm gonna have but, to look. Uh, I'm gonna have to look him up and see. Yeah, I'm not sure about the old law. What's going on? But hopefully he does get out. So let's talk a little bit about the violence, because Lewisburg was a violent place. I'm sure there was a back then. I there's probably a lot of DC dudes there, right? About well, five hundred. You ever see them beefing? Because, you know, they got a bad reputation from back then. And I talk about now that, like, a lot of the D.C. dudes are different. Like, they're not running around, like, beefing with each other. They're not running around raping dudes. Like, that stuff wasn't going on now when I was in the penitentiary. What was going on back then, I can't say because I wasn't there. But, I mean, what's your perspective? You ever see any violent conduct from them cats? Yeah, man, I seen, uh, you know, a couple incidents. Um Dude's beefing over the TV, DC dude and a Muslim DC cat and ends up stabbing him up. Uh, it just leaks out into the yard and just goes crazy from there. You know what I mean? Would it turn into a full fledged riot over there? Full fledged riot. Who was who won? <laughs> Shit. Well, you had you had some of the DC dudes that were Muslim, but they were like still on homie time, so they were like backing up the homies, and it was just you know. Dudes was, dude, they were digging up shit. Dudes were getting poked everywhere. I mean, it was crazy. Uh, it was like that all the time, though. You know what I'm saying? It was never, I never seen a hand fight. Never once did I see a hand fight over there. That, that's what I want to ask you. Do you feel like you were desensitized from all the violence, or do you think it affects you? And the reason I say that is because we talked a little bit. And usually I don't talk to people before I do the interviews. But me and you, we talked a little bit, and it seemed like it was hard for you to talk about some of this stuff. Is it hard for you? Yeah, it's 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 kind of hard to talk about it because I mean, you know, it's one thing watching somebody else speak about all this shit going on or like re- listening to you read your book, right? And you could relate to it. But when somebody else is actually, you know, putting you on the spot to speak about your experience, it's like you you could see it in your brain like it was yesterday, but you it's it's, it's like you can't deliver like that full like how it really was, you know what I mean? That, that's fair enough. Maybe you got a little PTSD. You've seen some things and you've experienced some things that, you know, were traumatic probably, bro. You know, some guys get on here and, you know, people want to be tough guys and all that, and that's fine, man. But at the end of the day, man, even the toughest guys are affected, bro. You know what I mean? I was affected by the things I've seen. Um, and I'm not afraid to admit it, and i said it before on shows. You know, my wife can tell you, and I can bring her down here. 
But, dude, there's times where I can watch something. Like, I watched that Troy Kell video, man, 10, 15 times. I'm going to do a video on Troy Kell. And, you know, at the point where he says, man, I fucked my whole life off. You know what? It made me start crying, bro. When I look at John Powers and I see that he bit his fingers off. And I used to be in a wreck cage with this dude, man. And, and it emotionally affected me. Sometimes I just get teary-eyed over the shit. Um, I did a video and I was talking about Shawshank Redemption. I was just reading quotes. And it affected me, man. I got a little bit, I had to catch myself in the middle of the video. Because you know what? When you're not just talking about it, but you lived it and you experienced it, it touches your life, man, in different ways that people that never, you know, put the shoes on that we had to put on or never danced the dance that we had to dance, they can never truly understand it, man. Do you agree with that? Yeah, yeah, definitely. This might be the place you need to be. This might be the the form for you. Do you think, you know, watching the videos and watching Blood on the Razor Wire TV helps you a little bit deal with some of that shit? Oh, definitely. I mean, I feel like, you know, even though we do all this time when we come home, we always, you know, you still have to make choices. And we all, there's all times where we, we may be thinking to do something that could put us back in that situation. You know what I mean? So just to watch it, it's like, you know, as you reflect on your life and as far as, you know, going back to that same situation. You know, there's a dude that wrote me and he said, Chad, I got my work boots right by my door. He said, I brought my prison boots home too. And they're sitting next to each other. And every morning I wake up, I have to decide what boots I want to put on. It's a reminder. And I'm going to tell you, man, just like 99% of the people, including yourself, and we're going to get into what you're doing in your life in a minute. But every day you put on them work boots, man, it's a whole lot easier than putting on them prison boots, right? Oh, yeah, definitely. Definitely, man. What was the hardest thing for you in prison, man? Uh, just, you know, based, just going in, man, and having no clue of what's really going on. The whole, there's a whole different world of uh, politics and, and rules and just codes and things you have to follow. I mean, you know. Go, coming into Lewisburg, bro, you learn from other people's mistakes. You have no room for a mistake. There's no second chances. You learn from seeing people lose their lives or see dudes getting their brain stomped in or stabbed up. I mean, that's you ain't getting no second chances over there, man. You fuck up. That's your whole career. I mean, especially if you got a lot of time, it's not there's only 13 penitentiaries in the whole United States. The small world, somebody's going to know you somewhere, right? If you do something wrong. Yeah, I mean, and that shit will catch up to you. Don't. It might be two years, three years, five years, and you might come on the line and be like, oh, what the, what the fuck is this dude doing here? And there, you know what I'm saying? It comes out the bag. Dude's a check-in, dude was doing fuck old people money, dude was fucking with boys, whatever it is, you know what I mean? Could be anything. When they find that out, what happens? Let's say a dude was... Uh... He checked in. Let's say he's in Lewisburg. He checks in. You see him in Beaumont, and he's from Boston. What usually happens to a guy like that? Tell the people. Uh, you know, the, they're going to greet him like he didn't do anything. He's going to come in. They're going to say, what's up, bro? How you doing? You know, come out after lunch. We're going to chop it up, blah, blah, blah. And they probably already have two or three people waiting for him right when he walks out them shower doors to put some holes in them. Smash them right away. Do you ever have to put in any work while you're in the pen? Oh, yeah. Yeah, definitely. You know, everybody comes in, you're on, you know, they got their little roster, you're on deck and all that. And, you know, like how you speak about in your videos, the paperwork shit and all that, you know, everybody got a paperwork at a checkout, probation, uh, you know, probation time with the homies and all that. But yeah, man. I mean, your your time always gonna come. You could you could avoid it for a while. Uh, you know, you got a bunch of new dudes. Uh, you know, you talk about torpedoes and shit like that. That the homies might shoot that way, but eventually, you know, you're gonna you're gonna have to show what who you really are. You know what I mean? So eventually, you know, they got what they call sometimes lames or missiles or torpedoes. Those are the dudes that are expendable to the shot caller. Let's say, you know, for example, Stevie Burke was the shot caller in. Big Sandy for the East Coast car, Boston and New York. And he would say, okay, we got this dude from Oklahoma. We got this dude from Pennsylvania. They're missiles. We're going to we're gonna throw them out there. But eventually, you might run out of missiles, and now your card plays. It's time for you to put in that work. And when they call, you got to answer, right? Yeah, and, and a lot of people want to see that shit, too. They'd be like, oh, you know, 
I heard what he was doing over here, but like, you know what I'm saying? Like, when's he going to show, you know, put some work in over here? People love that shit, man. They, people love to see that shit. People love to see violence. They like to see people destroyed. And it happens all the time in federal prison. A lot of people don't understand it. They think federal prison is uh, camp fed. We're eating steak and shrimp. We're watching cable TV. We're playing tennis. We're having a great time. Not true, is it? Nah, nah. There ain't no camp. There ain't no camp fed, bro. Definitely not. So you were with a bunch of dudes that I was with, man. I mean, we're you know we know a bunch of the same guys. You were with Donnie, and I, I spoke about Donnie in a video, man. Um, Donnie was almost done. He had a twenty-five year sentence, right, or thirty year sentence. He was almost to the door, and him and another kid named Blue they end up killing a dude, and I think it was in Atlanta, and he yep. ends up with a life sentence, right? Yeah. Yeah. Imagine that, man. It's one of the homies from Boston, right? Yeah. So can you imagine doing all that time, bro, and you get to the door and they're like, hey, look, man, you know what? We're going to get this cat out here, man. And you go out there. Really, a lot of dudes intend to just beat a dude up. And sometimes they accidentally kill people. And I think that's what happened with them. They meant to just, you know, pound the dude out, whatever, and, and they ended up killing him. Could you imagine what that's like to get ready to go home after doing almost 25 years? And now you get a life sentence. That's crazy, man. I was over there when that shit happened in Atlanta in the shoe. Um, they had a dude. They had a dude in, from Florida. He was new. He wasn't fucked up. His paperwork wasn't bad. Dude actually hit a fucking hit a sex offender. Was coming from somewhere else, just in transit, and um, you know he didn't he didn't know the politics, man. He was he was living with the black dude. You know, this, you know the story. I know the story, but the viewers don't. Tell me a little more about it. Uh, so basically, uh, from what I understand, allegedly, uh, <laughs> the dude the dude was living with somebody outside his race. He didn't really know there was any issue with that. He's from Florida. He's used to doing time with all different races, you know, a uh, diverse place, wherever he's from. And, uh, you know, basically just gave him the heads up. Listen, man, you're going to be going to over here. You can't be doing that. He was actually heading to the SMU program. Yeah. And uh, he's like, we don't do that. You know, he's like, all right. All right. So, you know, a couple of days went by or whatever. I guess his, you know, his bunkie was probably like, you know, do what the fuck you want to do. You make your own decisions. And uh, he made his decision. And that decision cost him his life in a wreck cage, right? Yeah. And really, he's not the only person that died that day. Three people died. He died, and the other two died by incarceration, meaning they're never getting out of prison. It's over, man. I think Don, I know Donnie got life, and I don't know what Blue got, maybe 25 or 30 years. I remember looking at it. But pretty much, man, his, he already had a, a bid to do. His life's over, man. It's over. Um, Let's talk a little bit about Adam, right? Let me see. I got a picture of Adam. You know, people hear about Adam all the time in the book. And I don't know if I got it close by, but tell me about Adam, man. You know, Adam ended up with a whole bunch more time, right? Yeah. So here, let's, Adam. this is Adam. I want people to see who Adam is, man. That's Adam right here on the end. That's when he was in the smooth program doing all them burpees. Um, He was a pretty big dude, bro. When I was with him, we were sellies. He was probably about 250, chubby. He ended up in the smooth program after he stabbed the cop, ended up with another 23, 25 years. Life is gone, man. And for real, people will think, oh, man, that guy, you know, he's a dangerous guy. He should never be in society. Was he a dangerous dude? Yeah, but you know what? He was a good dude. He had a good family, he, you know, and he just lived that prison life, man, to the fullest. He lived the life that people see on TV, man. Do you agree with that? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, he was a he was a good dude, man. I mean, had a great family, his kids. I know that 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 was everything to him, you know, so regardless of what he did to, you know, extend his stay or whatever, you know what I'm saying? The dude was a good dude, man. He was a good dude. He was a wild dude, but he was a good dude, man. And, you know, when all that shit happened and I found out how much time he got, dude, I ain't going to lie to you, man. I felt bad for Adam. Like, damn, man. His parents loved him to death, man. His father, I think his father was a military dude. You know, they lived in PA. They'd come up and visit him all the time send him money, take care of him. He went to prison a young, young man. And now he's going to probably get out when he's 70 or 80. He's going to get out, but his whole life is gone. And again, 
It's the Shawshank Redemption theory, man. He'll be like that dude that got out of prison in that movie and was like, what is this? You know what I'm saying? Like, what is this? When he went to prison, they had flip phones. You know what phones are going to look like, you know, 30, 40 years from now? Uh Crazy crazy life, man. So you end up leaving Lewisburg. Where do you go next? Uh, I go there. They they want to get me the fuck out of there, dude. I, it, what's crazy is Lewisburg was the last place to have cigarettes and still sell tobacco and all that shit. So I didn't want to go nowhere. I'm like, I told my case caseworker, I was like, I don't want to go nowhere. She's like, no, you're fucking, you're out of here, kid. Like you don't need to be here. But that's, that was all I knew. So this was the first place I came. So, I mean, regardless of what was going on, it wasn't really affecting me because I was so fucking young. And um, people weren't really on that type of time, like pushing on, pushing, pushing on me or anything like that. So, I mean, I, I, I kind of liked the place. So, <laughs> but yeah, I, I ended up going to FCI. I went to McKean and uh, I got in trouble there. And then uh, I went to Atlanta from Atlanta. I hit a dude over in Atlanta and ended up in Coleman one. I was in Coleman one for a while, and then I ended up hit, hitting one of the homies over there and sat in the shoe. They basically put me on like some diesel therapy shit, dragged me, put me in for the program. Uh, the program was, they said that they weren't going to take me. Then they put me in again, because you know how they could put you in twice. And then they just fucking shit me all over. I did the whole Oklahoma thing and all that, and I landed up in uh, Beaumont. And wrapped up there. When you were over in Beaumont, were you over there with um Larry Costello? Was Adam over there at that point? No, they had um. <clears throat> so Adam and all them, when they turned Beaumont into an FCI after those murders in the shoe with um with Snar in them, that F- it became an FCI right for about two years. When I came back, it was back USP. Um, so they had already shipped Adam and all them out of there and all the Texas dudes and all that shit. I think they end up going to like Hazleton and like uh, Pollock and Big Sandy, Lee and shit like that. That's where Stevie Burke and Adam, they ended up shipping them. Ronnie, um, Ronnie, Adam, Dennis, um, Stevie, they all ended up leaving Beaumont and they came to Big Sandy and Big Sandy became the new bloody Beaumont, so to speak. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's what happened when they closed Lewisburg. You know, basically, Hazleton, Big Sandy became Lewisburg. And then when they did the, the – they transferred all everybody else to Texas and they closed Texas for the FCI because they were like – there were so many, like, murders and stabbings happening. And then when those cops got stabbed and the dude got killed in the shoe, they're like, yeah, this place is fucking closed down. So they they closed it. They closed the USP, stayed like that for a couple of years, and then they reopened the USP and started bringing people from all over the place again. Definitely dangerous times. You talked about hitting one of the homies in Coleman. Can you talk about it? Yeah. Uh, you know, <clears throat> I got over there, and um, there's two sides. I had this side of the uh, the yard, basically, with the homies, and then the other homie had his side. You know, when I got there, there was a lot of weird shit going on. You know what I mean? The dude basically had what everybody wanted. So nobody's really doing what they're supposed to do. And um, when I when I went out and showed him some paperwork and shit like that, um, they basically didn't want to move on the dude. So we moved on all of them. Did you end up stabbing one of them? No, nah, no, nah, it's that we end up well he caught the drop because one of the one of the homies that were on our side, you know, basically told him to watch it, watch it. You know, something may happen. So when I got into it with them, he actually pulled out on me. They started dropping the bombs on the third yard. So they have uh in Beaumont, they have three sections, uh three sections of the yard. They have like the softball, then they have the middle basketball, and then they have like the recreation. Dropped the bombs on us. We got it in for a minute. You know, luckily, dude didn't, you know, get the up and start stabbing me. But he pulled it out. And um, they ended up letting him back out. 
So I'm back because this is how big this dude's name is, bro. He already had the line over here for years. So they're like, oh, it's got to be me. I got to be the one that got to go. I'm like, okay. So I'm sitting in here. I'm sitting in the, back in the shoe. And, uh, you know, my bunkie was in there. I was like, oh, when you get out, deal with that. And uh, they went and hit dude and crushed him. You say who it was? Who it was? Yeah. Yeah, yeah it's... Uh, yeah, yeah, so, so the, the dude's, dude's from Boston. Boston. Dude's, dude's name is Paul D. Called Jero. Not the younger one, the the dad. Uh, so yeah. But he was doing some stuff over there that he wasn't supposed to be doing. But it is what it is, man. I'm, I don't want to put you on the on the on the spot, but you know, some people want to hear it, man. They want to know who it was. They want to, you know, it's like watching a movie, man. And you don't get to see the ending. You know what I'm saying? But that's not really why we're on here, man. We're really on here to talk about some positive stuff, too. It ain't just about how dangerous prison is. But the reason I do that is because I want people to know. I want people to know what it's like to be a drug dealer. That this is the part of being a drug dealer. This is the other part. It's dangerous. You can lose your life in there. Your own homeboys will turn their back on you. But how long have you been out of prison? That's where we're going. Uh, going on five years. Do you ever violate? No. Nope. Never violated got out did you get married or have kids or anything like that yeah i got out got married uh three three daughters since i've been home four three and two uh got, got a, a restaurant, restaurant opened a restaurant been working you know just focusing in on my family and just uh you know life out here i'm not gonna lie to you man i'm gonna keep it real with you i can see that prison has affected you man i can see that although you've been out of prison all them years there's things that you probably could never forget there's things that remind you and it's not easy to talk about i mean people watching the video are going to see that it's not easy for you but right now man you're living your best life is this the life that you dreamed about when you were sitting in your cell alone you ever think like damn i just want to get out of here and be normal yeah yeah definitely man it was uh you know 15 years bro that's a long time you know I ended up doing 15, not 14. I did all my time in some. Um, and uh, when I came out, you know, I didn't like, you're talking about the phones and all that. I didn't, I, I didn't, I never seen Facebook. I never seen, you know, all these different things going on. I didn't, you know what I'm saying? So I came out just kind of crazy, you know what I mean? I hear you. What was one of the things that you missed the most while you were sitting in prison? You know, I, I miss seeing my, you know, my parents, uh, my mom and dad. I didn't see them. Uh, I didn't see my dad the whole time I was gone. So I didn't see him for like 14 years. I see, him, you know, maybe once. Um, both of my parents, I've probably seen once the whole time I was gone. Um, I missed my my daughter's entire childhood you know what i mean um didn't get to see anything with that and um you know when you're when you're in there you, in my like for me i kind of just shut off everything i was so far away that um i just started bidding and that's how i dealt with my doing time just working out getting into you know the routine in there and just trying to forget about everything Ever think you were never going to get out that you'd never make it out of beaumont or never make it out of lewisburg did you ever have them thoughts yeah man i honestly I, I i didn't think i would ever get out you know there was so much fucking violence in there dude like i've honestly never seen nothing like it in my life i didn't even know shit like that was happening kind of what my next question is right you're going to federal prison. You're just a young kid. You're 22 years old. You know you're getting 15 years. Are you thinking in your head, well, hey, it's federal prison. I'm going to be all right. It's, it's, it's a good place? Yeah. Uh, you know, you hear shit like that, that fed, can't, uh, you know, club fed and all that. I mean, dude, I remember when I hit Oklahoma and was um, – went through the went through the transfer center and they were telling me basically you, you go you go in and they tell you where you're going and you know the guys in front of the computer and uh I walk in 
And I'm like, oh, where am I going? He's like, so he, he put my number in and all that. He's like, he's like, oh shit. Like he literally was like, wow. He's like, you're going to Lewisburg, the big house. So I'm like, the big house. That's what they, that's what they call Lewisburg, right? So I, I don't know what the fuck that is, you know? So when I went out and I went back into the uh, the tank, you know, everybody's telling people where they're going. And one of the old old heads was like, oh, where are you going? And I was like, uh, Lewisburg. And they're like, oh, man. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> you know? Let me tell you this. I've been there, bro. And they told me I was going to Big Sandy. I'm like, Big Sandy. And people are like, like, dude, I'm glad I'm not going to Big Sandy. I'm like, why? What's up? And I started hearing stories. And I'm like, fuck. And then that's what people don't understand. You have to make that decision, bro. And, you know, I've seen plenty of people make the wrong decision. You're on that bus. You get to the prison. And there's dudes that are like, man, hey, I can't be here. You got to make that choice, man. I've seen dudes so scared that they're just like, I can't be here. And they destroy their they destroy their prison career. Because as soon as you say you can't be here and you check in, guess what? Somebody's going to see you. And some dudes, we had a homie from Buffalo, bro. He checked in everywhere. He checked in in Atwater. He left Atwater. He checked in in Pollock. He left Pollock. He got the Big Sandy. He was out on the yard with us for a month or two before we knew. And then he checked in at Big Sandy. But you know what the crazy part is? Everything was good. He had an arson charge. He, um... <laughs> This dude, it makes me laugh because I got a picture of him in here, man. Rick from Buffalo. And, dude, we're just like, I ended up seeing him in the shoe like, dude, why did you check in? He's like, dude, I'm scared. Everything was good. Paperwork, crime, everything. He was just scared. And he checked in everywhere he went. You've seen shit like that? Bro, when I got off the bus, there was probably about 12 of us. And I think maybe three of us actually hit the line. And they tell, they told, I mean, when I got to Beaumont, they tell you the same thing, man. They're telling you, if you're fucked up, bust that right. Don't go on the line because they're not fucking playing no games. They already know you're coming. You know, you got the laundry people already telling them that such and such is coming. They know you're coming. They know who you are. They know what the fuck you did, whether it was here, on the street, or whatever, dude. And they would tell you. If any form of way, if you're fucked up, don't go on this line. Crazy, crazy life that we live, man. So look, you got a restaurant. You got you got some kids. You got three daughters. I, I think you had a, a kids from a different relationship because you talked about your older daughter not being there. But um, you're living your best life now, right? Yeah, man, I'm trying. It's not easy. I mean, you know. There's still struggles with anything, whether you, you know, you have a restaurant or whatever, you always, uh, it's about choices though. Definitely about choices, but are you happy that you put that life behind you? Yeah, man, definitely. I'm definitely happy I put that shit behind me. So, like I said, before we close, right, a couple things, man. First thing I want to do is I want to ask you, like I asked earlier a little bit, you ever lay in your bunk and think like, damn, man, someday I want to have a wife and I want to have kids? Because I've done it, bro. I used to imagine this shit. I had 40 years in prison, dude. Like you talked yeah. about Jimmy Coonan and, you know, Nikki and some of them guys, like they're never getting out, but you would never know. But dude, at night was the times when I'd lay there in my bunk sometimes and just stare at the ceiling and be like, damn, man, I just want to be normal, bro. How many times you daydream about that? I think that sometimes I think that's what... uh gets us out you know i mean we think so much of what we want to do when we get out you know you will fucking just get stuck on that thought you know what i mean and um for some type of hope you know you you know you're calling your family trying to stay stay keep you you like stay outside in the world even though you're in here you think you got a broken piece in you you think a part of you is broken forever because of your experiences because of prison Uh, man, I definitely, I feel like I'll definitely never look at life the same for sure. Do you feel bad inside that you left dudes behind like Donnie and Adam? You know, like you see some of these military dudes and some people might not like this, but you know what? In a lot of ways, man, we're in our own war in there, right? 
all we got is each other, man. They're like our brothers, man. So for me, when you leave people behind like that, it did hurt my feelings. I wonder, I wonder if it hurts you at all, man. Yeah, I mean, man, I met a lot of good dudes and um, a lot of people I thought were good too. And, uh, you know, I, def I definitely feel for them having to stay there. And uh, I feel like, like I, I talk to my old bunkie sometimes and I'm like, man, when we got released out of Beaumont, so when I got to Beaumont, we were, we, I came in on lockdown. And when I wrapped up, I came, I left on lockdown. I mean, you know, it's just, people ain't trying to get out over there, bro. It's like, you don't feel like you're ever going to get out. Every day, something's happening. Uh, constant fucking drama, constant politics, lockdowns, riots, murders. I mean, I was over there when all that shit was happening in Beaumont. I was over there when uh, Crazy Face and Ricky killed their bunkie and put him up under the bunk. And he was there for like three hours. You know what I mean? Yeah, I know the, I know the, I know the case. I know the situation. You t are you talking about Ricky Fackrell, Sack kid? Yeah, 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 and uh, and uh, Chris Crazy. Kramer. Yeah. So, you know, I did a little. Did you see the video I did on them? Yeah, yeah. And so you know, they both got the death penalty, right? I do. Yeah. Did you see the pictures of their uh, boy they killed? Yeah, I, I know, I know all of them. I we is all on the line, all working out together. Everybody go out there, do burpees in the morning. We, you know, uh, they were in the they were in the next block over from me. But um, yeah, dude, I was over there with all them dudes when that shit happened. And I mean, they were talking about, you know, a white dude getting killed for like weeks before before it happened. You know what I mean? Really, that was their brother. That was their homeboy. They killed him because he was getting high and wouldn't stop, right? Owed some money, that type of shit, right? Yeah. So the same dudes that are eating with you, working out with you, they end up killing you, man. Happens all the time behind the wall, right? Yeah, definitely, man. That shit's crazy. So look, man, you're a dad now. You're a husband. You're a business owner. You know, your past doesn't dictate your future, man, obviously. um, There are some cats that come home and they jump back on that wrong road. They go down that old dusty road, man. And they keep hitting the same old bumps. But you haven't done that, man. And I respect you for it. So before we close, right, what would you tell your younger self, man, about crime and about going to federal prison? Or what would you tell some young man or a son or a nephew? What would you tell him if he's on the wrong road? You know, I, I talk to this. I talk, I talk about this to my wife. And I'm like, you know, I just wish I was more interested in sports and school. I wish I had uh, better role models and people I looked up to. I mean, I feel like that's important, man. Uh, all the people I looked up to, they were fucking street dudes and people that were doing bad shit. You know, and now looking back on it, I'm like, you know, just wish I had better role models and yeah, could people just to give me a little more guidance feel you, man. So, you know, we look up to them street dudes when we're young. Some of us make the wrong choices instead of looking up to, you know, the Stefan Diggs or the Josh Allens. We look up to the guy out on the corner, but we don't, we see the glamour, but we don't see the pain that's inside, inside their hearts. We don't see the pain that they have when they end up in prison as young men. And we're like, wow, man, what happened to Billy? Oh, he's gone. He's in prison. And sometimes we think that, you know, that's cool, man, but it's not cool. So look, I'm going to tell you, man, I appreciate you coming on the show. Appreciate you sharing your experiences. I know it wasn't easy, but definitely appreciate you giving us some insight. A guy that was actually with Crazy Face and with Ricky Fackrell, you know, you shed some light. It's not just us talking about it, but look, man, I appreciate you. I'm going to tell people, man, hit that subscribe button, hit the like button, share the video, and don't forget to leave a comment. Blood on the razor wire with respect. Until tomorrow, we're out. <laughs>